this edition of All About Hopkinton. I'm your host, Mary Arnott. All About Hopkinton is the HCAM show created to bring you information about people and organizations from within and around our wonderful community. The show today is a very special one about Susan Graham and Jennifer Cray from the New England Donor Services Organization. Susan is here to share her story in hopes that it will help everyone facing similar challenges. Welcome, Susan, and Thank welcome, you. Jennifer. Thank you. I can't tell you how much I'm grateful that both of you are here today, because this is not an easy topic to talk about, um, but it's a very important one, and we want to get the information out there, and, and we do hope that it will help many people, including yourself, Susan. Thank you. So why don't we start a little bit with you and tell us a little bit about yourself and what brings you to the show today. Okay. Um, I've lived in Hopkinton for about 25 years. Uh, I've been married for 35. I have polycystic kidney disease, which is a uh, hereditary disease, genetic, that causes cysts to grow on both of my kidneys. Um, as the cysts enlarge and increase, kidney function decreases, and eventually the cysts completely overtake the kidneys and the kidneys become non-functioning. Now when we were talking a little bit before the show, you said that uh, the polycystic kidney disease is something that is very, um, well you, you don't know you have it until it can be a little bit too late. So tell us a little bit about that. Right, because um, I guess luckily, uh, as kidney function decreases, there aren't really any symptoms. Um, you could get high blood pressure, but there are a lot of things that can cause high blood pressure, so people don't necessarily think kidneys. Um, right now, my kidneys are only functioning at about 5%, and other than being a little bit tired, I feel completely fine. So. If I didn't know that I had this disease, I, well, I, not having any symptoms, I wouldn't know. And apparently it's more common than most people realize. And tell us a little bit about how you found out. What made you decide to get tested to find out? Okay, um, we found out that my mom had the disease. And the way we found out that my mom had it is an interesting story. When I was a teenager, many years ago. We were sitting at home watching TV one evening, my mom, my dad, my sister and I, and the phone rang and it was a gentleman from Minnesota. His name is Maurice Murphy, we call him Mo, and uh, unbeknownst to us he was a or is a very distant relative. Um, my great, great great, I believe, grandmother was one of 13 children and 12 of her siblings moved from England to the Minneapolis area. And Mo, m many, many, many years later, realized that a lot of people in the family were getting a kidney disease or dying from kidney disease and so he was curious why and started tracing a family tree. Um, my great-great-great-grandmother was the only one that had stayed in England and so they had difficulty finding my mom but finally did. She had moved to Canada um, and we got this phone call out of nowhere and my mom was really surprised because she had had high blood pressure and had been taking medication but they didn't really pin down why. And so this complete stranger called to say, I've been looking for you for many years and I'm uh, sorry to have to tell you, but the reason I'm doing all this family research is to warn people that there is this kidney disease in our family. So my mom got tested. So when she got tested and found out, then you also decided to get tested and got the results. Right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Well, it's good news, bad news. We're glad that Maurice exactly. did this research and contacted <laughs> yeah. people, right? Because you might not have ever gone to right. get tested and wouldn't right. have known. But 
Exactly. So, so tell us a little bit about where you are now then. What's the circumstances? Okay, so um, right now I'm preparing for dialysis. Uh, last week I just had surgery to place a catheter uh, in my stomach. I'm going to do what's called peritoneal dialysis where um, there's fluid put into my stomach through the catheter and that fluid while it dwells in my stomach cleanses my blood and then that fluid is removed. Um, I'm one of the lucky ones that's going to be able to do it at home with a machine while I sleep at night. The machine is going to do it for me. Um, I have to hook up to it probably for seven or eight hours a night, but at least I can do it while I'm sleeping. Uh, unfortunately, many other people can't do it for a variety of reasons, can't do it that way and have to go to dialysis centers. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the type of dialysis that more people are familiar with. And you are currently on uh, a donor registration list. Is that what you were telling me? That you? I am on the transplant waiting yet list. Yes, I've been on the list for about three and a half years uh, in Massachusetts. Unfortunately, in this area, the waiting list for an organ, um, well, for a kidney, I should say. I'm not sure about other organs. Perhaps Jen knows, but for a kidney, the um, average wait time right now is six years. Okay, and we're going to talk about New England Donor Services, and Jennifer, we know you have a lot of important information to share with us. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us, what is New England Donor Services? Sure. So we're, the, uh, we're one of 58 OPOs, organ procurement organizations across the country, um, that recover organs and tissue from deceased donors so that we can help people just like Susan. Our mission is to save and heal lives through organ and tissue donation. Um, we want people to be uh, transplanted as quickly as possible. It's a better outcome for the, for the uh, transplant patient. Um, so that's our work here in New England. We cover the six New England states. And again, there's 58 OPOs across the country. There are different wait times, um, like we were just discussing and Susan had mentioned. and. Uh, you know, waiting for a kidney here in Massachusetts in the Northeast is a long way. It's too long, um, and we want to try to help that. And there's different reasons why. Um, fortunately, a lot of people do say yes to donation, that they would be an organ donor. Um, but not everybody realizes that there's an important step to take, that registering is important. Um, be becoming an organ donor when we pass away is a, is a rare event. Mm -hmm. Only about 5% of the entire population will die in a way that we can donate our organs uh, after we die. And that's not because we didn't register or we did register. It's for clinical reasons. Um, organs shut down very quickly when we pass away. Uh, so um, s for someone to be an organ donor, they have to pa pass away in a hospital setting. Um, so that's so again, it's a rare event, and we don't want to miss an opportunity to save lives if someone believes in organ donation. So one of our strongest messages when we go out there, um, we do a lot of programs in the communities. Uh, Susan does a lot of volunteering with us, um, just starting conversations, getting that message out, and really helping people understand um, if you know what is organ donation, is it right for you, and if so, here's how you how you register and sign up. And I think most of us know becoming an organ donor, signing up to be an organ donor rather, we, we do that when we check the yes box on our driver's license. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, um, each time we renew a driver's license or a state ID, we should check that yes box. Um, but we can also sign up online. Um, here's the online donor registry, registerme.org. Mm -hmm. um, anyone can go there. 24-7, uh, sign up pretty easily, pretty quickly. You can even do this on your Apple iPhones now. There's an app for that in your health app. So um, this is a really important step to take. And we will share that website and also the website for the New England Donor Services Organization at the end of the show today. That information will appear in the credits uh, so that when people watch the show, then they can find out, you know, make sure they, they make note of that. But in Susan's case, uh, she's looking for a kidney, and people can become kidney donors when they're still alive, right? That yes. is true, yes, because we all have two kidneys, and 
we only really need one. We can function full, so fully with one function. kidney. Yes, yeah. we can. So does your organization, Jennifer, also help with people who want to donate um, a kidney and they're still alive? They right, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, about half of all kidney transplants are done with living donors now. Um, so there is not a registry to be a living donor at this time. So when we receive um, interest from someone who wants to be a living donor, um, we will explore with them, do you know someone who's currently waiting? Um, let's say they do and they want to see if they match Susan and be a donor for her, we will send them to Susan's transplant center where they can look to see if this person is a good candidate to donate their kidney and if they would match Susan. Um, if s someone um, comes forward and says, I'd like to help, I don't know anybody waiting, but I know that the list is long and I, I think I'm healthy and I could help, then we would work with them, where do you live, and work with them on um, setting them up at a transplant program that's close to them. Um, I would imagine that many people um, are hesitant to be a donor um, either during life or after their life. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of, do you run into people and, and talk to them about their hesitations and what are the, some of the things they say why they hesitate to do, become a donor? Yes, when I'm talking to people out in the community, when I go to community events, there are I think four main reasons that people are hesitant to register to donate. Um, the first one I hear a lot is, oh, I'm too old. <laughs> you don't All want my organs. They're too old. Um, that's not true. Uh, nobody's too old to register. Nothing precludes anyone from registering because the uh, decision, as Jen was talking about earlier, as to whether or not you're going to end up donating is made at the time of your passing, not the day you register. Um, we had, I believe, um, our oldest known donor is, was a 97-year-old who donated corneas, I believe. Is I, that accurate? Uh, it might even be a little older, cornea. Older, okay. And, and Oregon was, um, the gentleman was just shy of his 93rd birthday, mm. and he donated his liver to a woman who was waiting at 69 years of age. Um, but yeah, the cornea donor, I think, was in upper upper 90s. Yeah. And uh, now, see, that's something I wouldn't have thought. I wouldn't. I would have thought there might have been age restriction. Um, and so that's that's no. a good thing to know. That and a, a lot of people um, say, I'm too old, you know, especially my corneas. Oh, I wear glasses. I have really bad eyesight. You mm -hmm. don't want my corneas. Well, you have better eyesight than a blind person. Even if you don't have perfect eyesight, mm -hmm. to give sight to somebody who can't see is an amazing gift, no matter how old your corneas are. Uh, the other objection, I hear is that, um, oh, I've had cancer or I, I've had some other uh, ailment. Um, again, doesn't matter uh, because the way I look at it, we make so many advances in medical science every day. Uh, hopefully in the future, your um, medical history won't even matter. Hopefully everybody can donate in the future. So again, you know, check yes when you go to the registry and renew your license because who knows, it's better to be registered. Um, you probably hear this too, oh, if I have that little red heart on my license and I get sick or I'm in a car accident, the doctors and EMTs won't try as hard to save me because they know I'm an organ donor. That is... Completely I can see how that could become a fear, <laughs> but yeah, it's an unjustified fear, but I can yes. see how that would be a fear of Absolutely, people, yeah. because somebody's life is, that's the most important thing. That's all the doctors and EMTs are trying to do is save right. your life. Um, only when every effort to save your life has failed does organ donation even come into the conversation and then at that point it's really taken out of their hands and in um, New England Donor Services steps in and 
Right, the, hosp the hospital's are, role, just like Susan said, is to save, save lives, period, mm -hmm. help people. Right. And when, unfortunately, you can't always save that life. When that happens, um, there's a federal mandate. Every hospital must report every death to the organ procurement organization in their service area. And that's really important um, because then our staff, the OPO staff, can then see, okay, is this person now a candidate uh, to save someone else's life through organ and tissue donation? And our staff will be the ones to then you know, work with the hospital and the family, talk with the family so that we have that donations discussion with the family as opposed to the hospital. And that's a really good point that Susan brought up so that people know that, yeah, again, hospitals, EMT, state police, everyone's trying to save your life, period. Jennifer, do you know, how does it work if a person is um, on the list for a transplant? Is there, what's the, the process? Is it sure. sequential, first in, first out? Or I mean, how does that, or is it by the, yeah. uh, how severe you, your disease is and you know, how you're age? What are the factors that determine who gets an organ and who doesn't? Yeah, exactly. So um, there are many factors, as you can imagine. So when someone um, like Susan needs a transplant, they're in organ failure and they need a transplant to survive, um, we all go through UNOS, the United Network of Organ Sharing. Um, so they uh, govern the entire transplant and donation process here in the United States. So when Susan is listed for a transplant, her transplant program is putting her into that UNOS database. She becomes a letter number code. Um, we're blind to who is listed. Um, what's, what's entered is her height, her weight, her, uh, where she's listed, you know, so Boston, Mass, Worcester, Massachusetts, wherever in the country that transplant program is, um, tissue type, blood type, all of that goes into the database. Then when an OPO, like New England Donor Services, an organ procurement organization, has someone who's passed away and they died in a way that they could, can be a donor, our staff, we're putting in the same information into that database, height, weight, tissue type, blood type, and you start the database makes the matches based on that information. We'll look at that, um, that um, listing that comes out from there. So when we have a potential donor, someone's passed away, and it looks like they can safely donate, <clears throat> we'll look at that listing and see, okay, it looks like um, you know, right kidney is a match to a patient at Mass General Hospital Program. Um, looks like uh, heart matches a patient at um, Tufts uh, in, in Boston, Massachusetts, and so forth. And again, there's no names being shared, mm -hmm. but then what we'll do is our staff, our clinical staff, will contact the transplant programs so that Susan Surgeon can look at that information should she come up as a potential match and see, okay, you know, this is going to work for my patient. I'm going to accept that organ for her. So. Okay, so if a person's in a hospital and um, their organs are failing, but they can be kept alive by a transplant, um, and then you've got someone in that hospital who passes away, I mean, this must all happen very quickly somehow, and it seems like there would be so much information to share to get this matching to come out. And or in case of Susan, where she's able to function, you know, and carry on her life during the day, and she's going to do her dialysis at night, um, are all doctors' offices, all hospitals, all clinics, are they all looking at these databases, you know, like frequently? To s sure, sure. The, so the OPOs are because mm -hmm. when we have someone who passes away and they can be a donor, they've died in a way that we know that they can safely donate to help somebody else. We we're and you know we have access to that database, and we're, uh, we have staff who are contacting those transplant programs immediately. And then with technology today, um, very quickly we can share all kinds of information about the, the particular organ that we're offering to the transplant program, so that the surgeon knows exactly is this the right organ for my patient, and will will save her life. Um, we can share information, all the. Um, uh, serologies, all those, the blood testing we do is done very quickly. Um, we're not waiting days. We don't have days. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you, you get all that information very quickly and present it to the transplant program so they know exactly what this organ looks like. And, and we take photographs as well. Yep. Okay. But for um, 
someone who wants to be a living donor of one of their kidneys, mm -hmm. that doesn't go through the same procedure in terms of determining who gets it, right? Like if Susan had someone who was compatible uh, in her family or circle of friends or just anybody watching this program says, gee, I would like to be tested to see if I could be a kidney donor. That happens in a different process, doesn't it? Correct. That is with the transplant program because the transplant program is based at a hospital. Yeah. Whereas OPOs, organ procurement organizations, we're not a hospital. So we just don't have the ability to perform surgeries in our facilities. Um, it has to be done in a hospital. So yeah, so that's a living donor. A transplant that takes place with a living donor is all done through the transplant program. And they, um, and they work really hard. If someone comes forward to say, you know, I'd like to be a, a living donor, not only do they do the whole physical workup to make sure this person is perfectly healthy and will do well donating mm -hmm. um, and then recovery do really well, they also have to make sure that emotionally they're okay for this. Um, you know, people do come forward, I want to help, but you know, maybe um, emotionally they're really not ready to take this on. It's, you know, do you have children at home, for example? What happens when you're recovering from this surgery? Because it is a surgery. Do you have child care? You know, so they help people, the potential living donor, think about those, those types of situations to make sure it, it will work for everybody involved. And Susan, in your case, are you, you're able to register at different hospitals and different places? Um, you don't have to register just in that you need a transplant. You don't have to just be on a list in Massachusetts. Right? That's correct. Um, the country is divided into, is it 12 regions, Jen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it doesn't make sense to be listed at more than one hospital in your region because you're basically on the same, same list. list. Okay. But for example, I'm also registered down in Miami in Florida. They have shorter wait times down there. So what I did was uh, researched all of the transplant centers down the East Coast, I did my research and, and decided which one I was most comfortable with and I went through testing in Miami also and I'm also listed down there. Okay, so if I needed, uh, if I was in a similar situation as you and needed a kidney transplant, I could register in all 12 regions in the United States if I wanted to. It's possible. I mean, it's possible. Um, each transplant center that you approach likes to do their own testing, mm -hmm. so then the issue perhaps comes into play of perhaps your insurance company doesn't want to keep repeating tests. I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, and you have to make sure if you're listed somewhere that's not your home, mm -hmm. you know, um, can you get to that transplant program right. in the correct amount of time? Right. Um, so you're not going to, if you live in Massachusetts, you're not going to list yourself in California unless you're right. going to move to California. R exactly. That's why I researched down the East Coast because I can easily get anywhere um, on a plane or by driving, just jump in a car and you can drive down to Florida in 18 hours. So I can or see less, where so. if it was a organ coming from a person who had deceased and the hospital has to keep the organ viable for the time until the person can get there who needs it. Exactly. That might be different than in the case of where someone could get a kidney uh, from a live person and go out, you know, the West Coast or something like that. Right, so right. the important thing is to work with organizations like New England Donor Services and hospitals to get the right information about your situation and what's the best way to make sure that you can get that organ as quickly as possible given your circumstances, I would think. Exactly, so. mm -hmm. because I have known several people that have moved for that purpose. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're somebody that unfortunately can't do that. That that's you know, as you said, you have to research what your options are and what's going to work out best for you. Okay. 
And before we run out of time, I wanted to ask you, Jennifer, what kind of um, volunteer services can people do for the New England Donor Services Organization? Sure. Because you have a lot of volunteers, and you actually coordinate those volunteers, I do, right? yep. That's my role at the organization. I run our volunteer program, so I work with people just like Susan. Um, most of our volunteers have some kind of personal connection to this. Um, they're very passionate about it, want to share their stories, their experiences, mm -hmm. so that other people can understand it a little bit better. You know, we meet people all the time who say, oh yeah, I've always checked that yes box when I got my driver's license, when I renew it, but I really don't know what it means. <laughs> and after talking with Susan, now I know what it means and why this is so important. So if anyone's interested in volunteering, we'd love to have you as part of our organization. Um, you know, and especially if people, you don't have to, but if you do have that personal connection, we know a lot of people right here in Hopkinton, um, all across the state, there are people who have their stories, their experiences, and um, if they'd like to share them, we'd love to have you with us. Right. Any last thoughts that you want to, or information you want to make sure we address? Because we're running out of time very quickly here. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I would just like to say if you are a registered organ donor, thank you so much. And if you haven't already registered, please consider it because you can save up to eight people's lives and help many, many more. And in the case of if your case, if someone is interested in being a live donor of a kidney, uh, to feel free to come forward and get tested? And yes, please, absolutely. Uh, my blood is type O, so that would be the first requirement. All right. Well, thank you both for being here today. I really appreciate it. And I've got to read my little closing now. <laughs> sure. Thank you, Susan, again for your, the courage to share your story. I wish you the best in getting the transplant as soon as possible. Thank you. And Jennifer, thank you as well for explaining how New England Donor Services helps those in need of an organ transplant. I appreciate both being here very much in the show today. I hope many people will be inspired to become donors. To my audience, thank you for watching this program. For more information on, about organ transplants, visit the website donatelifenewengland.org or registerme.org to become a transplant donor. Thank you for watching All About Hopkinton. I'm Mary Arnott.